So first of all, thank you very much for everyone for being here when it's sub-zero, truly sub-zero outside. Seems like the winter has arrived. Um, I'm Suhin Wan. Um, I am from United Hospital. Um, and I'm here to talk about cardiac amyloidosis today. Um, the topic, the, the title I included um, says, From Heart Failure to Heart Success. So why did I do that? Well, to be honest, cardiac amyloidosis, even just over a decade ago, was truly a death sentence, right? There was really no medications and, and nothing we could do. But that's completely changed over the past several years with all the research and medications coming out. So that's why I'm so passionate about this topic is that now it's really a timely topic because there's something we can do about it. And the challenge now is identifying all these patients with such an underrecognized disease. So I want to thank um, you know, Dr. Sharkey, Ross Garbridge, Maya, um, you know, everyone at NHIF, as well as the um, heart failure team um, over at United and our partners. Um, in heart failure. Um, so doctors Alan Bank, Manfred Sabarau, um, Dr. Peter Ekman, um, who's here today, and also uh, Peter Zimboa, um, our, our heart failure team. So without further ado, let's get started. I have no disclosures. And we'll talk about the objectives for today and what I want to cover. We have a short period of time and a lot of uh, information to go over. So first of all, I'd like to talk about the pathophysiology. What is cardiac amyloidosis, and what are the different types of cardiac amyloidosis. Next, we'll talk about the diagnostic workup. When do we start to suspect that someone has cardiac amyloidosis? And what are the imaging features? What do we see on echocardio echocardiography? What do we see on cardiac MRI? And finally, we'll talk about the prognosis, and most importantly, the treatment for cardiac amyloidosis and what specifically we can do. Keeping in mind that depending on the type of cardiac amyloidosis, the treatment is very, very different. So let's start with a case. So we have a 50-year-old African-American man comes in with worsening exertional dyspnea for about two months, has a history of paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, also has a history of bilateral carpal tunnel, but no known family history of heart disease or uh, heart failure. On physical examination, there's jugular venous distension, bibasal bi crackles um, and on the lung exam, and two plus pitting edema on, of the lower extremity. There's evidence, clinical evidence of heart failure. This is a pretty typical patient that we see in heart failure clinic, right? It really could be you know, any sort of heart failure. Very, very common. Um, and then you continue further. So on an EKG, there's low voltage. On an echocardiogram, the ejection fraction is preserved, um, but there's diastolic dysfunction. The walls are thick concentrically. The valves are thick. Everything is thick. The RV wall is thick. And the strain pattern is abnormal. We'll talk a little bit more about that and how that's relevant to cardiac amyloidosis. Um, and then you get a cardiac MRI to try and figure out what exactly the etiology of the heart failure is. Um, and you see diffuse subendocardial late gadolinium enhancement. We'll talk a little bit more about cardiac MRI findings as well. So then you start to suspect cardiac amyloidosis. And then the next step is you obtain some lab and some urine and also imaging study. And we'll talk about this in the diagnostic workup. But very briefly, um, it's SPEP, UPEP, so serum and urine protein electrophoresis, free light chains, immunofixation, and the results show a normal kappa to lambda ratio, no monoclonal protein spike, um, but NT-proB and P-intraponin are elevated. And then you obtain a PYP scan, which is vastly abnormal, it's three plus on a visual score. And you send the patient to genetics, and it comes back abnormal for the val isoleucine. Mutation. So your diagnosis is um, uh, mutant TTR. And we'll talk about we'll talk about all this. But I think this is a pretty typical case where the the clinical history, right, and the examination is pretty common. Right? This is our typical heart failure. It's one of the you know, heart failure, heart attack, these are the most common things we see in cardiology clinic. And but as you dive in deeper and you really have to start to think about it, right, and do these unique tests, 
if you don't think about it, you never find it, right? So I think this highlights kind of the um, specific uh, features on echocardiography, the specific features on clinical history that is um, suggestive of cardiac amyloidosis and raises the concern and the importance of uh, diving further. So we'll go into our first objective and talk about what specifically amyloidosis is. And it can affect many different organs. Um, because this is cardiology, we're going to focus specifically on the heart and the types of amyloid that affect the heart. Amyloidosis, um, very broadly, basically entails the extracellular deposition of serum protein fibrils. Right? And these are proteins, these are abnormally folded proteins that deposit in the tissue, and it results in non-functional organs. Right? The, basically, the heart muscle, it's not heart muscle, right? but it's in the same area as causing dysfunction to the heart muscle. And in particular, more commonly, we see diastolic dysfunction. It causes the heart to be stiff. It's not contractile muscle. Um, so that is generally the, the problem. We get these beta pleated sheets, and it can deposit in a variety of organs. Again, we're focusing here on the heart, but it can deposit in the kidneys. It can deposit in the liver. Um, it can de deposit in the nervous system. So we talk about bilateral carpal tunnel you know, as uh, something that um, runs along with cardiac amyloidosis. So we start to think about it. But this is the reason why. It's because these abnormally folded proteins can deposit really anywhere. Um, now, there are two main types we think about for the heart. And these are abnormally folded proteins that could deposit in the heart muscle and the heart tissue. So we have AL, um, which is light chain, and then TTR, which stands for transthyretin. It's actually a, a thyroid-related transport protein, but it's abnormally folded and get, it gets deposited um, in the tissue. So the way I think about it, um, I, I really try to break it down, right? So AL and TTR, ATTR, you first think about where the protein factory is, where this, these abnormal proteins or the abnormally folded proteins are made, right? Because that's going to help your that's going to help in your diagnostic pathway. It's also going to help as you consider treatment right, and how to fix this. So for AL, the abnormal protein factory is the bone marrow, these plasma cells in the bone marrow. So this very much runs along the same lines of conditions like multiple myeloma, MGUS, these kind of all go together. And this is also in the realm of our colleagues from hematology and oncology, and that will guide um, treatment for this condition. In cardiology, oftentimes we focus on ATTR, and the abnormal protein factory in this case is the liver, right? And, and this is the, the situation where we dive into treatment where we can make a huge impact um, in the cardiology clinic, um, and we'll talk about the medications. But um, it's the abnormal protein factory is the liver, and then we think about the two types. So we generally divide TTR into two types. There's a hereditary type, and sometimes you see it with an H for hereditary, or M for mutant, or V for variant, um, but this is H, A-T-T-R. And then there is the wild type, okay, um, W-T, A-T-T-R. Um, these are, are previously called senile, um, you know, cardiac amyloidosis. It's really not a great term. The reason it was called that was because it is found generally in the older population, but uh, it, that is not exclusively true, right? So we, we try to really go away um, from that term. But the idea is there are, for the hereditary type, there is a mutation, right? So there's a family history. Um, there's variable expression. So it's challenging. It's not, uh, we don't know for sure when um, and if, you know, the phenotype would manifest itself. But this uh, it factors into uh, screening, family screening and, and discussions with a family when someone is found to have hereditary uh, ATTR. Um, the wild type, there is no mutation, but there is an acquired, it's an acquired condition. Um, and the challenge um, with this is we'll talk about you know, transplantation, liver transplantation uh, in the treatment section. But if you think about it, um, whether someone has an inherited mutation versus an acquired 
condition where they abnormally fold the proteins that affects uh, the effectiveness of something like a liver transplant tissue. So we'll dive in a little bit more on the TTR type. Um, that's uh, one of the common types we see um, when uh, in cardiology clinic. Uh, we talked about the liver um, already, and uh, the transthyretin being a thyroid hormone transport. The liver produces TTR, but then it breaks apart, and these monomers um, are misfolded. And that's, that's uh, ultimately the problem. These deposit in the end organ in the heart and causes the heart muscle to be very stiff and wall thickening and diastolic dysfunction, everything that we see on imaging. So let's talk a bit about the epidemiology. So for AL, generally it's a little bit younger population, you know, around 40, 40 years old or greater. TTR, a little bit older population, 70, year, 70 years old plus. Um, wild type, you know, again, the previously called senile type, that we, we don't use that term anymore. Um, but that's generally seen in a little bit of older population um, compared to, uh, to the other type. And the symptoms that um, we see are very generic symptoms, right? These are generic heart failure symptoms. We have dyspnea, low extremity edema, hepatic congestion, patients can have syncope, um, you know, autonomic dysfunction. These are very common. We see this all the time in heart failure. So it's really not specific, right? It's, it, it doesn't differentiate it. And again, it speaks to the idea that you really have to think about it. If you don't think about cardiac amyloidosis, you're never going to find it. You can, you're just going to diagnose someone with heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, and there are no guidelines for that. You just diuresis and treat that way. But you have to really start. It's such a heterogeneous condition, the, um, di the uh, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, that we really have to think of the reason why someone has it. Now, one thing I didn't include on here um, is the prevalence. Right? You don't see prevalence. That's usually what we talk about for epidemiology. And that was on purpose, right? I didn't include prevalence information because the honest truth is we don't know. We do, it's under-recognized. It's under-diagnosed. We don't think about it, right? So what have studies shown? Okay, so in a population of heart failure with preserved ejection fraction patients, studies have shown 15%, up to 15%, or even over 17% of patients have cardiac amyloidosis if we're, we were to do biopsies or actually look um, at the heart and think about whether or not patients have cardiac amyloidosis. Right? The honest truth is this percentage is probably a lot higher. I mean, how many people do we diagnose with heart failure with preserved ejection fraction? They decline, don't do well, right? And then that's their diagnosis, right? They pass away, they have heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, right? A large subset of that population probably has cardiac amyloidosis. So I didn't include the 15%, you know, here, but you know, that's, you know, there's some numbers, lots of different studies, it ranges kind of probably from five to 15% of patients with heart failure with preserved ejection fraction have cardiac amyloidosis, but I mean, that, that number is probably so much higher. So let's put this into perspective again. So we back away from the trees and we think about the forest. So we think about how many patients there are in the United States with heart failure. Right, six to seven million patients with heart failure. Of those with heart failure, we know about half of them have heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, half of them with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. So let's conserve the rest of it. It's at six million, that's three million, right, with heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. And now we think 15% of that, right? Up to 15% of those patients might have cardiac amyloidosis. And you think about how many cardiac amyloidosis patients you see in heart failure clinics or in general cardiology clinics. And you start to recognize that so many of these are underdiagnosed. Now, 20 years ago, you could argue it doesn't matter, right? There's nothing we do to treat it. We maybe have prognostic information, right? But we can't change the trajectory of cardiac amyloidosis. But now that's changed. Now we actually have multiple medications that we can use to either treat the symptoms or to affect the, the mortality and the, the ultimate outcome. So, I just want to put a plug in there. It's important to think about, right? The testing's easy. We'll talk about the testing. That's the beauty of it, right? It's not a high risk, you know, invasive test. It's it's lab work and some imaging. So um, we'll talk more about that later. What are the complications? So and the association. So we talked about heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. At some point, these patients do eventually have heart failure with 
reduce ejection fraction as well if it affects the heart muscle enough such that it can't function. There's a lot of arrhythmias, as you can imagine, with a lot of infiltrative cardiomyopathies. This is where amyloid falls into, the family of infiltrative cardiomyopathies. You can get bradycardia, sinus node dysfunction, AV block, um, a lot of ventricular arrhythmias. And then thromboembolism, that's an important uh, component um, to think about, to think about stroke um, prevention um, in cardiac amyloidosis. And then aortic stenosis is a huge component. And uh, Dr. Maria Gesso and uh, Dr. Joao Calvacante and Eric Schaubert, um, they're, all, all of them are very interested in this area, you know, cardiac amyloidosis and valve disease. But um, you know, Dr. Calvacante and others specifically have looked at outcomes, right? In aortic stenosis patients, we're at center here. We see a lot of patients with aortic stenosis. You know, a lot of TAVRs happen here. And, what, are, what is the prognosis of these patients that potentially have cardiac amyloid? The last thing you want to do is do a TAVR on a patient, right? And they don't do well at all, right? They, they deteriorate. They feel worse. They have worsening symptoms. So it's, it's absolutely essential to identify these patients with cardiac amyloidosis, and there's a huge overlap with aortic stenosis. Um, so, so studies of here have shown that the the cardiac amyloidosis, first of all, it's prevalent among the aortic stenosis population. And then I think, you know, it, it makes um, common sense from that that these patients don't do as well um, as patients without uh, amyloidosis. So what about AL amyloidosis? So um, what do we see in this patient population? So it can affect the kidneys. So we see proteinuria. We see nephrotic syndrome. There's a lot of... Um, yeah, other symptoms as well. It's not exclusive to AL. We certainly see this with TTR. It's important as we talk about management, but peripheral neuropathy, we talk about the carpal tunnel. There could be gastrointestinal symptoms like GI bleeding. And then some physical examination findings. So um, uh, when I was training at, at, at uh, Mayo, we presented on kind of the physical uh, uh, exam findings and features, but patients can get macroglossia, patients can get paraorbital purpura. Um, so these uh, kind of features of raccoon eyes, you can have these kind of shawl signs. So there are many physical exam findings that, again, you really have to think about. You, you normally don't think about these things when we're treating heart failure patients, but it's really on the exam, taking into account the whole patient and, and using all the information um, that you have. What about EKG, so low voltage? And again, this is not, this is obviously not specific, right, to cardiac amyloidosis. So someone with bad COPD, someone who is obese, um, can have low voltage as well. But it's a piece of the puzzle, right? I think it's another part that if you have a heart failure with preserved ejection fracture patient, you have some physical exam findings, you see this, right? Then you start to think, you know, could it be cardiac amyloidosis, and could you easily test for it, right, and, and order some labs and urine and, and, and do the PYP scan. What about the cardiomyopathy? So generally, it's restrictive cardiomyopathy is a feature. We talked about diastolic dysfunction um, already, but again, um, cardiac amyloidosis is in the family of infiltrative cardiomyopathy. So we think about also sarcoidosis. We think about things like hemochromatosis. Um, but this is a secondary type of restrictive cardiomyopathy, so it's not idiopathic, it's not primary. Um, and it's, it's not, you know, you think about other things too, right, could, could the restrictive cardiomyopathy be secondary to radiation or other causes? But I think amyloidosis should be at the forefront of everyone's mind, and it, it really is, um, it needs to be ruled out. Okay, so now we kind of shift gears a little bit from our first objective, talking about what cardiac amyloidosis is to talking about the imaging features, right, of um, uh, uh, cardiac amyloidosis and uh, diastolic dysfunction and restrictive cardiomyopathy in general. So this is a um, uh, apical four-chamber view. It's um, flipped. Um, it's a Mayo view. Um, but basically, we see that the um, the left ventricle and the right ventricular size is relatively normal. The volumes are relatively normal. The atria are very enlarged, right? The atria is very enlarged. So, you know, the pointer, we have the um, left atrium here. 
very enlarged, right atrium, right? Kind of a brief uh, tangent and a side reminder. So the reason why we know this is slip um, is because we look at the um, insertion point. So we know this is a tricuspid valve with a more apically displaced insertion point on our apical four chamber view on the echo. So we know this is the left side, this is the right side, right? But look at the proportion. I mean, the left atrium is about as big, you know, as the left ventricle, right? That means the pressures are high here in the left atrium. It's really, you're having to force it down into, and you see the thick walls here in the um, left ventricle, right? This is a you're infiltrating, infiltrative cardiomyopathy here. So these are kind of the features, and you think about the, so what are the consequences too? So enlarged atria, right? You think about atrial fibrillation, right? That's, a com that's something that's commonly associated with restrictive cardiomyopathy and, and with, uh, with cardiac amyloidosis. So this is kind of a typical picture that you would see with something with cardiac amyloid. Also thick valves, we can't really see the valves well here, but thick everything is thick, right? This is an infiltrative cardiomyopathy, it's depositing in the heart muscle. So the RV free wall is thick. That is kind of a more specific feature, right? Thick LV walls is not specific. They can have thick LV walls because of hypertension. They have thick LV walls because of aortic stenosis, right? Anything that increases in afterload can cause concentric hypertrophy, right? But the RV wall shouldn't really be thick, particularly if there's not bad, you know, pulmonary hypertension, right? Why is the RV wall thick? Why are the valves thick, right? Maybe someone is, you know, 70 years old, 80 years old, they have aortic stenosis because of their age, right? But why is the mitral valve thick? Why is there mitral regurgitation? Right. Why, why are the atrial walls thick? The atria really shouldn't be thick. So these are, these are these um, red flags, or so to say, things that are abnormal. You think physiologically, right? This doesn't make sense. There's maybe something a little bit more here than you can explain with pressure and volume in our, our general hemodynamics. Those are the features um, to think about that you start to think about something like cardiac amyloidosis. What about Dopplers, right? Doppler echocardiography. So, um, you know, again, this is not specific to cardiac amyloidosis, but we think about, you know, high filling pressures, right? You think about you know, the atria is large, are large. Um, you know, the E wave is very large. You're forcing the blood in really in early diastole, right? The, the atrial contraction contribution is poor, right? The atria are large. It's not really contracting well. It's being infiltrated. So this is a typical Doppler pattern um, that we see. Uh, for cardiac amyloidosis. Decrease E primes, right? So this is the tissue Doppler. This is the movement of the annulus and the septal wall um, of the LV, right? It's not moving very well, right? It's, uh, there's, uh, you have abnormal, abnormally folded protein infiltration. The heart muscle's not moving well. Um, you basically get low E primes and a high E to E prime ratio. So, um, this is kind of a, a typical um, you know, autopsy finding. You can, again, see very, very thick walls. Um, biventricular thickening, so 12, so kind of keep the 12 millimeter in mind. We'll come back to this, um, but greater than 12 millimeter for the LV wall. This actually factors into the ESC uh, consensus uh, statement on when we start to think about cardiac amyloidosis. A myocardial speckling appearance, so this is obviously very subjective. What exactly does this mean? But Sometimes it's described as you, you look at the pictures, right, and it looks better than you would normally expect for an ultrasound picture. I mean, we think about ultrasound pictures as being very fuzzy, you know, difficult to, to visualize, but this is something, wow, it really jumps out at you. It almost looks better than you normally think about. So, again, a very subjective, very subjective finding on echocardiography. Um, but it's important because like these amyloid proteins that get deposited actually make your pictures look better than you probably expect, you know, for an ultrasound picture. Dilated atria, we talked about intraatrial septal thickening, just thickening everywhere. Thickening there, thickening in the valve, thickening of the RV, dilated IVC, pericardial effusion. So again, this is a parasternal long axis view, really thick walls, large atria, uh, kind of similar. Um, to the apical four chamber view that we saw. Strain. Okay, strain is absolutely essential, right? And we have actually piloted a project um, with the help of um, 
Heidi and Gail, our, our um, you know, echo and imaging lab directors over at United, to automatically do strains when we suspect okay, cardiac amyloidosis, right? So we have to set the criteria. So in this particular example, we say when there's concentric hypertrophy with a septal diameter of greater than 15 millimeters, okay, that's probably on the conservative side. Remember, 12 is the number that I'd like you guys to remember. Um, but we said greater than 15 millimeters for the septal wall, no other explanation, automatically do strains, right? And this is a pattern that you see. And part of this has to do, so it's, it's, a, it's a cherry on top. So that's kind of the, the terminology um, or the, the easy way to remember it, right? But it's apical sparing. So red um, means you have good movement, right? You know, a light color, kind of a pinkish color or a white color means you do not, okay? So this is the apical sparing pattern. So you actually have good movement at the tip or at the apex of the heart, right? But not elsewhere. And a lot of this, you know, nobody really knows why, right, for cardiac amyloidosis. There are some, um, you know, there are some hypotheses. So I think how, how the heart muscle, um, if you think about how, how on a microscopic level, on a pathologic level, the fibros are, are, are structured. Um, so it kind of, you know, all these uh, um, heart muscle fibers um, insert in the apex, right? So there's more of it at the apex. So that... There's some theories as to why maybe it affects the apex a little bit less. If you think about kind of the torsional component, um, it's not just, um, it's a kind of a rotating component. It's not just a longitudinal component. Um, so we, we think about different strain patterns too um, and different types of strain, you know, whether it's rotational or longitudinal. But I think nobody really knows why, but it's, it's, it's essential to um, try and do strains, right? Because this is more specific for cardiac amyloidosis, and this pattern should really, really push someone towards further investigation. We talked about elevation in labs, so troponin and, and BNP or anti-pro-BNP. Again, this, this component is hugely nonspecific, right? This would be any, any of our heart failure patients. So what does the European Society of Cardiology say? What does the ESC say about screening for cardiac amyloidosis? Right, so you look at this picture and you kind of scratch your head, right? That's kind of everyone in heart failure. So, so basically you need left ventricular wall thickness, right, of greater than 12 millimeters. Keeping in mind that generally, you know, a lot of patients we see might be hanging around 10, 11 millimeters, generally, normally, that we think about echo. You think about our measurement error might be a couple millimeters, okay? So this could be pretty much everyone, right? And then you look at so heart failure, diagnosis of heart failure greater than 65 years old, right? How many of our heart failure patients are greater than 65? How many of our patients have aortic stenosis and are greater than 65? This is LV wall thickness that's increased plus one or more of the following, right? Hyper, uh, hypotension, okay, or normal tensive if previously hypertensive, right? Sensory involvement, autonomic dysfunction. This is a kind of potentially syncope on our uh, clinical findings. Peripheral polyneuropathy, we talked about bilateral carpal tunnel syndrome. Photonuria, skin bruising, right? We, bilateral carpal tunnel, ruptured biceps tendon. Cardiac MRI findings, we'll go over uh, that in a little bit. Increase or increase extracellular volume. Reduced longitudinal strain with apical sparing, right? So, so, so many of these patients are identified, can be identified in the echo lab. We think about how many echocardiograms we get, right, for other reasons, for whatever reason, right, we get an echo, and you see thick walls, right, and you, you do the strain pattern, you see that apical sparing, right, based on this ESC, you know, recommendation, those patients should be screened for cardiac amyloidosis. In the absence of anything else, you don't even have to examine the patient, just in the absence of any clinical history or exam findings, right. Decreased QRS voltage, so the two ways AV conduction disease, possible family history. So in other words, I mean, to summarize the slides, it's basically everyone with heart failure, right? You should think about cardiac amyloidosis. But this is a pretty low bar. I mean, in all seriousness, I think these are the features to think about, right? But this is a pretty low bar. And again, the nice thing about diagnosis is that it's non-invasive for the most part, right? And it's easy. Um, this is a study that um, came out recently that, that I really like. So um, it utilizes 
uh, machine learning, right, and artificial intelligence, and that's obviously the buzzword nowadays um, in medicine. But um, Sanjeev Shah from, uh, from Northwestern basically looked at different features, so cardiac features, right, and non-cardiac features. And then basically, you know, there's over a thousand patients here um, with, uh, you know, diagnosed wild type TTR amyloid and just run it through the computer, basically, right? We're identifying features that are associated with cardiac amyloidosis to try and develop a risk calculator or some sort of uh, way to screen, you know, which patient should we really screen for uh, car cardiac amyloidosis, right? So this is for wild type TTR specifically. And you have on the x-axis the odds ratio, right? And then the y-axis prevalence, right, of, the, of these conditions, right? and cardiac and non-cardiac features. So let's take something like over here. So atrial fibrillation, right? Super prevalent, we know that, right? But the odds ratio is not particularly high. A lot of patients have atrial, fibrilla have atrial fibrillation for whatever reason, right? So it doesn't mean everyone with atrial fibrillation has cardiac amyloidosis, right? But it's, it's important to think about. So on the y-axis, you think about, yeah, if they have cardiac amyloidosis, this runs very much, you know, with it. So these are the patients you start to think about anticoagulation, right? AFib, cardiac amyloidosis, they're high risk of a stroke, right? So I think the y-axis here is really helpful to think about concurrent cardiac disease and what are the implications, you know, of patients with cardiac amyloidosis. You know, hypertension, hypertensive heart disease, with valve disease over here, tricuspid valve disorder, mitral valve disorder, right? Things over here, you know, we start to think it as, as, you know, a little bit more specific potentially, but maybe less common, but really high for odds ratio. So cardiogenic shock, these are really sick patients. These are deteriorating patients, basically. These are the phenotypes. Um, pericardial effusion, you know, pericarditis. Um, atrial flutter is kind of over here, conduction disease. So I think this is a very, you know, very interesting. It doesn't tell us exactly why, right? But it's probably pretty accurate since it, run, it ran, a, you know, a, uh, uh, basically a large population of, you know, truly diagnosed wild type TTR patients, you know, through a machine learning algorithm. Over here, non-cardiac features, right? These are the things that, again, we kind of, uh, uh, you know, expect. So multiple myeloma, um, you know, paraproteinemia, uh, proteinemia. and then over here, you know, abnormal blood work. Um, we have kind of, you know, carpal tunnel, um, it's not specifically on here, but tendon rupture. So kind of a lot of the things we think about. Um, but I, I think this is more an interesting exercise. And there have been other groups. So um, the Mayo Clinic group has also looked at in, into d developing kind of risk prediction analysis. Um, but the idea is, the bottom line is just think about it, right? Think about it. It's common. And if you don't think about it, you never find it. So um, this is part of Continuing our objective two, so diagnosis. So how do we diagnose cardiac amyloidosis, right? This is from up to date. So this is an algorithm. So we have imaging features consistent with amyloidosis. In this particular case, it's cardiac MRI. So late gadolinium enhancement um, uh, with parametric T1 mapping uh, and increased extracellular volume fraction. You can also replace that with echo cardiographic features. If you have thick walls, if you have all, the, all of these echo features that we, we talked about, Right, think about patients that are high risk or we suspect may have cardiac amyloidosis. Then really the beauty of this condition is the testing is fairly easy. At least the initial testing is fairly easy. Right? You obtain blood work, you obtain urine, and you do a PYP scan. That's it. So serum kappa and lambda free light chain ratio, right? Serum protein immunofixation, urine protein immunofixation. Okay. SPAP, UPAP. Three light chains, okay, immunofixation of the blood and urine, okay? And then you're trying to figure out, is monoclonal protein detected by one or more of these tests, right? This is something, in fact, that can be, um, you know, um, uh, developed into EPIC, right, with our EPIC order sets. And this is a pilot that was done at, at United. Um, these can be button clicks. When you suspect someone, you click a button and it order, orders these tests. It really streamlines it, right? Because if you have to search for these tests individually, it is kind of challenging. And people who don't think about or see amyloid, sometimes they struggle to find the specific test number, right? Where, where are you going to search or in, in the box, right? But this can be um, 
basically made routine with a button click now with our electronic medical record system. So if this is yes, right, this first part is yes, monoclonal protein is detected, you're concerned about AL amyloid. This is, remember, protein, abnormal protein factory, bone marrow, right? So these are the patients you send urgently. This is not like you wait six months from now because that's probably, you know, how, long, how oftentimes nowadays you, you, you refer someone as a new patient and you have to wait months, you know, before they get an appointment. This is an urgent referral, right, to hematology. You know, for, for confirmation, and they may do a bone marrow biopsy, right, to confirm, you know, they may start treatment for AL amyloidosis, which is generally chemotherapy, right? These are patients whose life expectancy may be six months to a year. If you wait a year for their appointments, right, they may no, be no longer with us. So this is an urgent referral. What if that's negative, okay? You don't have as much concern for AL amyloidosis. Then the next part is do a PYP scan. PYP scan, nuclear cardiology study, initially really developed for bone purposes. It wasn't developed particularly for cardiac amyloidosis. Just as a side note, I mean, when, when the PYP scan was first investigated for, you know, cardiac amyloidosis, it failed. I mean, people thought it performed horribly. And the reason nowadays we know is because there are different types of cardiac amyloidosis. Before, they were applying PYP scans to everyone. So patients with AL amyloid, right, they do a PYP scan, and the rate of positive is pretty low, right? So there's a bad test, doesn't work, right? But if we focus specifically on TTR amyloid, it's actually pretty specific, right? To the point where if it's a grade two or three on the visual pattern, right, on the PYP scan, that's it. You have the diagnosis of TTR, start the treatment, right? You don't need a biopsy in that case. It's only in the kind of for those you know, um, equivocal cases, grade one, you know, equivocal cases, you're not sure, well, then you kind of have to know, right? Then you do an endomyocardial biopsy for confirmation and typing, right? So that you can know specifically, you know, whether or not someone has amyloid and what type of amyloid they have. The next part, of course, after this is also to send the genetics. Um, so Allison Berg uh, at the Abbott Northwestern is one of our wonderful partners um, who really helps uh, to identify, you know, whether or not this is a, a TTRM, a mutant type, uh, or hereditary type, or wild type, right? And this has implications for treatment, okay, and some of the medications that we use. This has implication for um, specifically family discussion, family screening, right? We think about if someone was diagnosed at age 60, for example, with hereditary ATTR, then their first degree relatives or their children, we should probably think about screening for amyloid about 10 years younger than when our patient was diagnosed. That's when we start to think about when it might manifest itself. Now, the challenge is that it's variable expression for the phenotype, so they may not, the first degree relative, even if they did inherit right, the, the mutation, they may never express it, or they may express it at a different age as our patient. Right, so that, that is a challenge, and that's, I think, really the next step uh, in research as to what we can do not only to treat patients with cardiac amyloidosis, because what we have right now just stabilizes the condition, it doesn't cure the condition, right, to actually identify high-risk patients and think about how we can affect the uh, disease progression. A little bit of a tangent, um, so cardiac MRI, we think about different cardiac MRI patterns and what they um, could represent. So our sub, remember from our case, sub-endocardial um, uh, late gallium enhancement um, throughout the entire heart, okay? That could be amyloidosis, okay? But if we think about different patterns, right? These are, the, all of these are logical, right? So we think about ischemic, right? Remember our epicardial arteries, right? Our, our main coronary arteries are outside the heart, okay? And then, so the outside of the heart gets supplied first, and then the inside, that's why usually with early ischemic heart disease, we get to see subendocardial infarct and abnormalities, right? Because the inside of the heart gets ischemic first. Our major coronary arteries are on the outside of epicardial, right? So subendocardial in the coronary artery distribution, transmural infarct, right? And then we have things like myocarditis, mid myocardium. That doesn't make any sense, you know, from an ischemic portion. So that's 
you know, could be myocarditis. So, so uh, to think about a lot of these patterns. Um, I try not to really memorize it, honestly, and they should kind of make sense. Like these are the abnormalities that we should kind of see when we think about physiologically what's going on. But this is the one down here. This is the one to think about for cardiac amyloidosis. Okay, PYP scan, not going to spend too much time. Basically, briefly, you're looking at the heart versus the contralateral ratio. So if the heart lights up, okay, so we see in the spec pictures, the CT pictures are theoretically better because you have a three-dimensional component, right? But if that side lights up compared to the other side, right, then that's abnormal. Um, now, the, the PYP can be there. You can have false positives and negatives. If you think about, for example, you have a pneumonia and it lights up over the area. If the pneumonia is behind the heart, right, you think about here, right, then that's going to be a false positive because it's going to light up. You're going to have a different ratio, right, but it's, it's due to pneumonia. It's not due to amyloidosis, right, or you have a bone fracture, anything that's metabolically increased uptake. If, it, if it's on the other side, if it's on the right side instead of the left side, you might have a false negative because then, you know, the ratio is the same, but again, it's because it's both sides that's abnormal. So this is a challenge with PYP. It's not, you know, it's not completely diagnostic. There are some uh, potential errors. I think the message is if it's visual score, if it's 2+, plus, 3+, plus, we're confident we can start treating, right? They have TTR amyloidosis. But sometimes you can be unsure, right? And that's the, that's the point where you need to do uh, additional testing, such as a cardiac biopsy to really confirm whether or not they have amyloidosis and then type it, figure out specifically what type of cardiac amyloidosis they have. Um, I won't talk too much about these. These are so the echocardiographic features in addition to helping diagnosis, okay, can also help with prognosis, right, and, and studies have looked at this. So we're kind of transitioning now into our last objective is talking about prognosis and treatment of cardiac amyloidosis. Um, this is a nice figure from uh, Maurer's um, study from a couple of years ago, basically looking at the abnormalities that we see and the time progression, right? So down here, disease process and related indicators and the appropriate tests and what they represent, right? So, so, so I want to highlight a couple of things right here. So look at clinical symptoms, right? So when patients come in, this is generally how we identify patients with cardiac amyloidosis, right? When they come in with heart failure symptoms. When they have clinical symptoms like dyspnea, fatigue, chest pain, neuropathy, right, these are heart failure symptoms, look at where they are on the progression of the disease. They are late, right? We have missed the boat on these patients, right? Now, the treatment is based on halting the progression of cardiac amyloidosis. It's not curing amyloidosis. So if we identify it here and start treatment with Tavamidus for TTR cardiac amyloidosis, this is where the patient will be. That's where they will stay. If we identify it here early, right, and we start thinking about it and screening and treating, right, then this is their progression. This is where we halt it, right? So that's why I think a lot of the prognosis and treatment information, the, you know, the, the numbers that we see, six months to a year for AL amyloid, right, three to five years for TTR cardiac amyloidosis, most of those are here, right? I believe that we can do a much better job of treating patients if we identify them here, right? So we need to have a high degree of suspicion. I've had patients sent to me because they have absolutely no cardiovascular symptoms or history, but, on, but sent to me by the orthopedic surgeons because when they did, you know, carpal tunnel surgery, they sent it, you know, for pathology, it came back positive for amyloid. Right, that is often the earliest manifestation. Now, I'm not suggesting that we treat or, or you know, screen everyone right, with carpal tunnel syndrome because it's, just, it's such a common condition. But we should at least think about it, right? And think about it, do they have other signs or symptoms that would suggest it? You know, we think about the PYP scan. If we identify on a PYP scan but nowhere else, right, they don't have symptoms yet. It's early, right? Cardiac MRI, biomarker. Echo. Everything pretty much is earlier than clinical symptoms, except for EKG finding, right? So think about it early, right? Systolic dysfunction. By the time they have a low EF, it's really too late. Okay. So this graph or this figure, I think, is a is a is a plug for me to say that 
really think about it early, because if you think about it early, you can make a difference early, right? So these are the numbers I kind of uh, you know, mentioned. TTR, kind of in the three to five year range, median survival without any intervention or treatment. AL, median survival of six months, right? But when I see my patients in clinic, if we identify here, you know, I don't tell them six months or three to five years. I tell them that you have the potential to do a lot better than these numbers, particularly if we start disease-modifying treatment and medication. Right? So this is, you know, this next part, you know, it's kind of getting towards the end, but it's potentially some of the most important component is why we're shifting a mindset from heart failure to heart success are the treatment options. Right? And, and the way to think about it, and there, there are new medications probably being approved you know, every year now for cardiac amyloidosis, but I put it basically into three buckets right? in, in terms of how cardiac amyloidosis is treated. Um, this is a, a figure from Dr. Martha Grogan from, from Mayo, but I really like it because um, there are basically three ways. You think about TTR amyloid, for example, three ways to affect the um, progression of the disease. You can stop production of these abnormal proteins from the liver, okay? That's the earliest phase, right? And there are a couple medications that work this way, right? So the siRNAs, you know, these mechanisms working early. This is great, you know, early, early. Um, Inotericin, patisseran, right? These are the medications that are now approved for treatment for hereditary TTR. Um, for um, neuropathy specifically, okay? So we think about stopping the production of the abnormal proteins, okay? Or, or uh, uh, you know, uh, stopping production of these proteins that have the potential to be abnormally misfolded. Then once we have the proteins or the abnormally folded proteins, we can stabilize them, right? So this is our tefamidus. This is the only medication right now that's approved specifically for cardiomyopathy in TTR amyloidosis. Um, but it's, see, it's not affecting it earlier, right? So you still have these abnormal proteins, you're stabilizing it. What has deposited in the heart, you can't affect those. Those have been deposited already, right? So we're not curing it. We're not changing the progression. We're not going backwards on this graph. We're just stopping it where it is. We're preventing more abnormal proteins from depositing. This can work pretty well, particularly if we identify these patients early, right? But by the late stage, when their ejection fraction is low, when they have a ton of heart failure symptoms, right, the benefit is probably lower, right, because you've kind of missed the boat already. There's so many abnormal proteins that have deposited in the heart, right, already. So that's kind of really the holy grail. That's the third part, right? These are fibrodisruptors. So these actually, you know, I shouldn't say dissolve, but actually go in and affect these abnormal proteins um, that are deposited. Right? And there are a lot of these you know, research molecules that are being looked at. Um, but this would be, if we can get a cure, right? if we can actually affect the abnormal proteins that are deposited um, and degrade them, right? that would be the ideal treatment option. Right? So three buckets. So we stop the production of abnormal proteins. We stabilize what's circulating in the serum to prevent deposition into end organ and we actually get rid of the abnormal proteins once they've deposited. So those are kind of the three buckets and where the research is currently ongoing um, for, for these medications. So we talk about tefamidus, right? So tefamidus, um, this article came out now in, uh, back in 2018 uh, in the New England uh, Journal of Medicine, but tefamidus is the only FDA um, approved medication for treatment of TTR, cardiomyopathy, specifically for the heart, right? And patients have great outcomes. You know, I've had patients on this, and it, it prevents further deposition, right, of these abnormal proteins. So if you identify these patients early, right, you can, you can affect their, you know, you can affect their outcome and tra trajectory. And sometimes we repeat the echo, and we see actually some regression of the wall thickness, improvements in arrhythmias. You know, I've heard from our EP colleagues that you know, the patients that we co-manage, maybe with ventricular arrhythmias or with AFib, actually do a lot better you know, after they're treated with cardiac amyloidosis. So this is really important um, to remember. This is for TTR. Remember our AL amyloid patients, we refer 
to hematology oncology for chemotherapy treatment. Okay, so it's really important to differentiate between AL and TTR because you don't want to use tefamidus for our AL patients, right? This is not going to do anything for our bone marrow abnormal protein factor. Okay, so what are some other considerations and some management considerations for amyloidosis, right? We think about spironolactone, so anecdotally, spironolactone works fairly well as a diuretic, particularly for patients with um, cardiac amyloidosis. We try to avoid beta blockers, okay? This is actually counterintuitive. Now, some patients, you need beta blockers because they have reduced ejection fraction, right? But for our preserved population, these patients have autonomic dysfunction, right? These patients have a stiff heart. They're heart rate dependent, right? So the risk is by using beta blockers, you could actually cause them to be more symptomatic. You can have more lightheadedness and side effects, basically, more orthostatic hypertension, being very careful, careful about the use of ACE inhibitors and ARBs. So this is a little bit counterintuitive, but we think about a heart failure population. You actually have, it's not that you don't use it. There are so many other reasons, why, right, why we use it. And again, our cardiac amyloid Doses patients can have other things. Maybe they had a heart attack. Maybe they have a little bit of reduced ejection fraction. So sometimes you need these medications. But just being aware and being aware of the dosing and, and side effects um, of these medications of the beta blockers and the ACE inhibitors and ARBs. We think about arrhythmias, atrial fibrillation. We talked about stroke prevention, anticoagulation already. It's a little bit unclear about ICD as there's some controversy about sudden cardiac death. But again, it's something to think about if they have other risk factors or if they have a lot of ventricular arrhythmias, it's important to have that discussion. Thromboembolism, aortic stenosis, we spent quite a bit of time talking about that already. Heart and liver transplantation. So the idea of liver transplant, right? So this abnormal protein factor in the liver for the hereditary or the mutant type, we think about, TT, we think about liver transplantation is actually curative, right? This is the importance of genetics. So it's important for the family members, right? But it's just as important for the patient, particularly for a younger patient, right? Because if it's a hereditary type, if it's a genetic type, by transplanting, you can actually cure it, right? For something like a WOW type, if it's acquired, you transplant it, they acquired the abnormality, they could still have the abnormal misfolding in the serum. So that's why it's particularly important to identify the hereditary type. For neuropathy, okay, there are now multiple medications approved on the market, okay, for treatment of these. These are, um, for the most part, injectables, okay, um, patisseran, vertisseran, um, inotericin, and eflontericin, okay. These um, uh, are basically for hereditary, um, TTR, amyloidosis with neuropathy. These have been shown to improve symptoms. Um, these are also being studied for cardiomyopathy. I think theoretically, we looked at that, um, the three buckets that I talked about for the treatment of cardiac amyloidosis. We think about, um, you know, these uh, early, right, the, the RNA um, um, uh, mechanism. Um, so theoretically, they may affect the cardiomyopathy, but that's ongoing. Um, that has not improved, been approved for that indication, for the cardiomyopathy indication. And then finally, our AL Patients um, oftentimes get Cyborg D, and there are a lot of ongoing uh, clinical trials as well. But these, it's important to have a very good working relationship with a hematologist, oncologist um, who is familiar, right, and sees a lot of cardiac amyloidosis. Because number one, you got to get them over quickly, right? You can't really wait six months, you know, to get that referral. Um, and number two, you have to really progress through that diagnostic pathway quickly, you know, if they need a bone marrow biopsy, if they need to be started on chemotherapy sooner rather than later. So it really is a partnership with our hematologist and oncologist. So we're kind of getting uh, towards the end of our hour. Um, we're kind of, I'm going to show the case again, I'm not going to go through it, but think about kind of everything we talked about for the, from the pathophysiology to the imaging features and the diagnostic pathway, and then talking about the prognosis, right, and the treatment implications of a typical case, you know, this is a typical heart failure patient that we see uh, in clinic. And then kind of, you know, thinking about the objectives and thinking about this pathway, thinking about what cardiac amyloidosis is, the different types, uh, ATTR and um, uh, AL, uh, thinking about that diagnostic algorithm, who do we start to suspect may have this, right? If we think about the ESC algorithm, it's pretty much everyone with heart failure, right? Heart failure is reserved ejection fraction. 
Think about your echo features um, that suggests you know, maybe someone might have cardiac amyloidosis. And think about that up-to-date diagnostic pathway. It's really easy. Serum, blood work, okay, some urine, and the PYP scan initially, right? at least non-invasive testing. And then thinking about the prognosis, right? why is it important to identify these patients early when we can have disease-modifying agents and stop the progression of uh, cardiac amyloidosis? And thinking about the treatments, right? Tefamidus for TTR, um, a lot of these um, medications, the injectables for neuropathy in hereditary TTR, and then the collaboration with our hematologists and oncologists for AL, cardiac amyloidosis. So that's all I have. Thank you very much, and happy to take any questions. Dr. Yeah, Eccles. A fantastic talk, a great summary. One of the things that's been a challenge is these meds are expensive. Can you talk a little bit about the cost and access of medications? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so Dr. Ekman asked about um, the cost of these medications, right? You know, as you can imagine, these medications, so Tefamidus is the only FDA-approved medication right now for cardiomyopathy, for TTR amyloid. So, I mean, these medications are in the hundreds of thousands of dollars per year, right? And, you know, patients can't afford that, right? So the most important thing, I think, you know, with anyone trying to, you know, increase the, um, uh, the, the, the population of amyloid that we you know, see and diagnose and develop a program is really working closely with our uh, pharmacists, right, and our pharmacy team. Because there are a lot of programs out there, I think both institutional and with the pharmaceutical companies that can help um, with the affordability of these medications, right? But it is, it is not a secret. I mean, these medications are some of the most expensive medications out there, period. Not just cardiac medications. Like, in general, like any medications out there, the most expensive medications out there. So I think having that streamlined working relationship with our cardiac pharmacists, you know, with our technicians, um, developing that in the cardiac amyloid program, that's absolutely essential. Because otherwise, if it takes you six months, right, or a year to get the approval, if you don't have that process in place, right, the, your patients are not going to benefit. So I think, you know, Dr. Eckman brings an excellent point. It's really important to get the infrastructure set up early, right, have that process, work with the pharmacist, okay, and be able to streamline that approval process and help our patients, you know, uh, you know afford these medications. Thank you. Thanks for a great talk. Um, you mentioned the prevalence of cardiac amyloid in patients with bilateral carpal tunnel and patients who've had referred you from pathology. Mm -hmm. um, Two-part question. One, um, any benefit to kind of speaking to orthopedic surgeons to make that their common practice to send pathology for either carpal tunnel or spinal stenosis surgery because there's good data to suggest it's a fairly prevalent condition in those patients. And then two, given your pathway of Kind of the, the onset relative to symptoms and that these studies have really only been in patients with symptomatic cardiac disease. Um, agree with you that the potential for benefiting patients, but the road to hell is paved with biological plausibility and they're incredibly expensive medications and are approved. So how do you approach kind of the when to pull the trigger on initiating disease modifying therapy seeing as those patients who are sent to you for the bilateral carpal tunnel are, are pre-symptomatic? Yeah, absolutely. So it's a wonderful question. So just to kind of summarize, so two-part question. One is regarding um, kind of working with an orthopedic surgeon, right, to develop a process, um, you know, potentially sending biopsies uh, to um, identify, you know, these patients early. And then second, because these medications are expensive, right, and it's a uh, potential challenging um, kind of when to, to where along that spectrum to start to think about um, you know, initiating for that first part, I think working with orthopedic surgery is absolutely essential. And I'm a big believer, it's not just orthopedic surgery, it's really everyone, right? It's, it's easier, you know, I think in a multi-specialty group where you have good relationships with really multiple specialties because, I mean, this is, so within cardiology, right, it really touches on everyone. It touches on electrophysiology, it touches on heart failure, it touches on our valvular team, right? It really touches on every aspect within cardiology. And imaging, you know, and then outside of cardiology, you know, the orthopedic surgeons, our neurologists, right, hematologists, oncologists. So I think that is a challenge. One of the challenges is convincing people that it's important, right? Orthopedic surgeons are so busy with so many different conditions. 
from my standpoint, yes, I mean, I would love for every person undergoing, you know, carpal tunnel surgery to have that tissue sent, you know, to see if they have amyloid, right? Then we identify it really early and we identify that here. The challenge is convincing the orthopedic surgeon that was well. So I think, I mean, it's a very slow process. Part of it is education, you know. I think part of it, it's a win-win for both sides too. If you convince the surgeon that it's important for them to know about this, right? They don't want to do carpal tunnel surgery and then have a patient that's really unhappy and they come back and say, you know, they, they, they are not happy with the outcome. Right? So I think it's really convincing them that it's really a win-win from both sides. It's a, you know, from a cardiac standpoint, we can identify patients early. From an orthopedic surgery outcome standpoint, the patient satisfaction, you know, it's really important. So I do believe it's absolutely essential to develop that collaboration. And, um, you know, again, I think it's going to be hard to convince every orthopedic surgeon, but you find your champion, um, people who may be interested in it. And yes, you start to set a precedent and, you know, send for pathology, you know, ident try to identify. The second part is, and that's kind of the second part of the question, you know, about when you really start these medications or when to think about starting it, because it's such an expensive process, right? Probably for diagnosis, an expensive process for the medication. I you know, think currently it is a challenge, right? But the hope is that, you know, literally every year there are new medications approved, you know, for cardiac amyloidosis, right? There are competitors. Um, I think as these medications stay on the market for longer, um, you know, they're going to be more widely available. Um, so I think that whole process will improve over time. I think it's going to be a slow improvement. I think the other component is there are a lot of research trials out there, right, answering these important questions about how early is early, right? So, you know, I know Dr. Calvacante, um, you know, one of the, the, the things that um, we're interested in is looking at prevention, right, in family members who are at high risk, right? So, you know, one potential study is that, you know, that we're looking into uh, being a part of is, you know, we have a known hereditary TTR patient. You look at a first degree relative, right, a family member, 10 years before that, right, with the age of onset diagnosis, that's when we start to think about it, right? And then they get enrolled in a clinical trial in which we think about, like, would tifamidus for these patients be beneficial? I think, you know, again, if you think about it from a, a pharmaceutical company standpoint, it's, again, a win-win because it's a, you know, part of it is, right, these medications are expensive. It's hard, you know, to get patients on these medications to, to, for them to afford it, right? But if we're able to show a benefit, right, then the, the, the population that's actually on these medications increases exponentially, right? If you think about the band, this is something, for example, not just for treatment, but for prevention, right, of amyloidosis. So I think it's on the pharmaceutical companies, you know, they have to invest in that, right? And they have to sponsor clinical trials and, you know, discover in this population if it's going to be helpful. But the cost is always going to be an issue, and I think the cost is a supply and demand issue, right? So the cost will improve as there are more competitors. The cost will improve, I think, as there are more patients with um, this diagnosis, right? But it, it always, I, I think, you know, as with most conditions, we think about, you know, stents, for example, versus surgery, right? We start with the sickest patients, right? And as it becomes more prevalent and common and there's more competition, then we're able to look earlier and earlier and earlier. And I think ultimately patients will have better outcomes. Yeah, excellent question. Thanks for that terrific talk. I was wondering, is there any uh, similarities between the amyloid plaques in the heart and the amyloid that's found in Alzheimer's disease in the brain? Yeah, yeah, though well, that's an excellent question. So, um, you know, we think about kind of, uh, you know, amyloid-related dementia, right? So in the heart, we specifically talk about the TTR and the AL, okay? So these are not necessarily the same specific types of amyloid that's deposited in the brain. But the honest truth is there's probably a lot of overlap, and the mechanism, right, is, is similar. I mean, amyloid are these abnormal proteins that are deposited. So um, I think, you know, the, the, the question, you know, begs itself as to whether or not someone with amyloid dementia or amyloid-related plaques in the brain should be screened for something like the heart. You know, I, I think it's not the exact same protein, per se, but they probably do the processes of these abnormal proteins to run together, and that would be, you know, other populations that we think about amyloid or, you know, other things, right? Amyloid in the kidneys, 
like the different proteins, um, but you know, do they have the same predisposition to um, forming cardiac angiogenesis? Well, I, I don't think we know, but it's an excellent, excellent question. Yes, we had an uh, excellent talk and great uh, overview, and so glad to have a champion uh, at United that is passionate about this topic. Um, I have a couple questions. One is, on that slide and building on what Steve had mentioned about building uh, the disease awareness, things that you are doing. Um, I think, you know, we need to build more for not only our cardiology group, but also other, you know, general practitioners. And I would say even patients, because, you know, you go to clinic and you have a few red flags, you start asking them, carpal tunnel syndrome, they know exactly what it is, they show. But then here we go, another five, 10 minutes to explain what cardiac amyloidosis is. Now we see commercials now coming up with uh, the feminists. Um, but it's important because they don't know what they don't know. And not only patients, but also general community. So I think efforts like that, uh, efforts uh, that you know, we have now with the order sets uh, that are across both campuses for both the patient and our patient are helpful, but is there a uh, society um, you know, doing, is there any movement uh, towards building that disease awareness. And the second question is in, you talk a lot about diagnosing, but now that we have made a diagnosis, start the treatment, how you monitor treatment response? Mm -hmm. yep, yep, excellent question. So, um, so uh, Dr. Kamakate kind of you know, uh, mentioned uh, two things. Uh, maybe uh, I'll answer the second part first. Um, so kind of monitoring the response um, to cardiac amyloidosis. Um, so, I mean, there are really, there's no necessarily consensus as to how to do it. I think, um, you know, I like using echocardiography, and we sometimes actually see some regression, for example, wall thickness and some of the features that we find. Um, from a uh, physiologic standpoint, and we think about the pathophysiology, using something like cardiac MRI uh, would make a ton of sense um, because it is much more specific uh, for cardiac amyloidosis. Um, I, I don't think there's a single consensus as to how we do it, but you know, in my mind, potentially getting like echoes, you know, every six months to a year, or repeating cardiac MRI in a year um, would be helpful. It's, it's challenging because like the FAMDIS, you know, again, is our only approved medication for cardiomyopathy. So there's not necessarily, there's not a dosing question. There's not something we can modify. Um, but I think um, it's important to think about tracking these patients and, you know, both clinically how they're doing and, and, and imaging. Um, imaging features. Um, I think the, uh, the second component, um, so you were talking about the, the, the uh, disease awareness and uh, patient for the primary care. Yes, yes. Yeah, so, so the question about kind of how to get the disease awareness um, and, and, and processes, you know, to encourage our primary care physicians to think about it, um, I think it's absolutely essential. I think it's absolutely essential. It, it, I think we, we probably don't do enough. You know, when we think about building cardiology programs, we focus on the cardiologist, right? But we think about identifying these patients, you know, as Dr. Conway Carthy mentioned, you know, by, we don't, the bilateral carpal tunnels don't start with us, don't start with cardiology. They start with prim the primary care physician, right? So I think it really is, the, the responsibility is on us, you know, as champions to reach out to primary care physicians to build that awareness. I think there are um, there are attempts. We probably don't do a good enough job. So there's a you know amyloid consortium and so forth. Uh, we try to recruit um, you know, primary care physicians, um, but it is really I, I think you know the two I, I would say the two most important aspects of of developing a report and convincing the primary care physicians why this is important is number one. This is a lot more common. Okay, then we think it is, okay? So um, that part is really important. And number two is there is now a lot we can do to modify the disease, particularly when we identify it early. I think these are probably the two biggest misconceptions from primary care. One is it's a rare disease, why do I need to think about it? And two, there's nothing we can do once we identify it anyway. So I think if we can change that mindset, my hope is that we would recruit more primary care physicians um, to also be champions, but I think, you know, uh, you know, it starts with us, it's a responsibility of us as cardiologists um, to convince primary care physicians, to convince the imaging lab, right? Oftentimes these are identified, we think about imaging findings before they develop clinical systems um, to be champions um, of this condition.
Dr. Wan, we just have two uh, virtual questions that are essentially the same question. Thank you so much for your time. Um, the question is, should we be screening all of our FF patients with uh, CMRI, or should we tailor depending on tissue, Doppler, et cetera? Yeah, yeah that's a very good question. So the, the question is kind of screening um, with cardiac MRI. I think here, you know, at Minneapolis Heart Institute, we are very fortunate because we are a center with a very strong MRI program. Okay, I, I'm not an MRI reader, but I absolutely, you know, trust our MRI readers. People like Eric Schaubert, you know, at United, you know, you know Joel Capacante. You, 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 it's very reliable, right? If it's positive on the cardiac MRI, you know, I really trust it. I think the challenge, you know, I've been at institutions where MRI, you know, is not as big. You know, maybe echocardiography is a much bigger program than cardiac MRI. So I think that's the first part is really developing and making MRIs more common, right? Because I think right now, if you look at you know, how many people have echocardio echocardiograms and how many people have cardiac MRIs, right? In general, across America, it's still very, very unbalanced. So the theoretical question is yes. I think everyone with heart failure preserved ejection fraction should get an MRI, I think it's super helpful. The realistic you know, answer is probably not because there are not that many cardiac MRI centers out there that are very reliable. And the last thing you want is to, to do cardiac MRIs and if you get these equivocal findings, it's really not helpful. Right? So I think that is, um, that is one of the biggest challenges, right? And again, as MRI, I think becomes more and more prevalent and you know, there's a, it starts the training program, we think about fellowships and imaging fellowships, more and more fellows are becoming interested in cardiac imaging. Um, but the, this is a, an area that we need to own because traditionally we work collaboratively with our radiologists and you know, this is really a cardiology problem you know, for heart failure. So we need to develop our own you know, cardiologists who are interested in MRI and work with the radiologists uh, to champion these, uh, these unique diagnoses. Thank you.